Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar um, hosted by AMPC. This is part of a series of our um, webinar series, and today we are thankful to have Angus Gidley Beard here to present. Angus is the Senior Analyst for Animal Protein with Rabo Research, Food and Agribusiness. Um, obviously, with everything that's been happening in the world, it's a very um, great topic to be able to hear today in terms of a market update around animal protein in a post-COVID world. Thank you, Angus, for joining today, and I'll hand over to you. All right, thanks, Amanda. And, and um, I, I suppose just quickly before I start, but is there an, opera an option for people if they have questions along the way to uh, submit questions, or do we wait till the end? Yes, sorry, Angus. Um, anyone that we encourage anyone to ask questions as we go through today. So in your taskbar, there is a questions option. If you actually type in your question there, we will forward them through to Angus and at the appropriate time, he'll be able to respond um, to, to any of those questions. Thanks for that. No worries. Thank you, Amanda. And um, yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to have a quick chat today with uh, uh, with all of those on the line, talking through some of the things that we're seeing in the global market from a, um, a COVID-19 impacts point of view. Um, and uh, I suppose leading towards the end of the presentation as to what we might think or what we think might mean it might mean for uh, the future of uh, red meat consumption and the red meat industry in Australia. Um, a, a little bit of background on me and uh, why I'm speaking I suppose. Um, Rabobank if you haven't heard or you're not aware of um, is a solely food and agri focused bank and we've got um, global offices around the world. It's, it's originally set up as a cooperative or was originally set up as a Cooperative in the Netherlands. Uh, it does operate as a normal retail bank in the in the Netherlands, similar to an ANZ or an NAB here. Uh, but every everything else outside of the Netherlands is just solely food and agriculture. So um, we've got a very strong focus in that space, and as a result, um, they've got a dedicated team of of analysts, of which I am one of. So around the world, there are about 90 of us in the different regions where Rabo operates, looking across all the different sectors, the ag sectors that we're involved in. So. I don't have, um, I'm not uh, in, in the bank side of things, so any questions on loans and interest rates, um, I can't really answer. I can provide you names with people who could. Um, my sole focus is to look at uh, what we call the animal protein market in Australia. So that uh, for me covers beef, sheep meat, pork, poultry and seafood. And as I said, we've got colleagues around the world that look at that industry. Um, uh, but also a whole range of other sectors as well, from GNO uh, through to consumer foods, etc., and all the way up and down the supply chain. So whether you're a, uh, at the producer end, or even sorry, the farm inputs end, all the way through producer, um, feedlot processor, retailer, and then looking at the consumer markets as well. So that's where I fit in this space. Um, and that's sort of the area that I cover and therefore as a result um, do a fair bit of this uh, speaking to, to various groups uh, but also predominantly providing information through to our Rabo clients on what's going on in the market at the time um, and some sort of providing them some sort of insight as to what might happen in the future and hopefully helping them make their business decisions. So that's a bit about me. Um, onto the topic today, and, and you might have seen the title at the front. It was, uh, I've got it titled Bulls and Bears, because really I think the Australian animal protein space, or really, sorry, I should say the Australian sheep and beef industry is in this unique situation where we've got uh, on one hand, those global impacts uh, that are COVID-19 and um, slowing economic conditions, plus the whole range of other things that go in there, US-China trade relations, you know, Brexit, all those sorts of things. Uh, but on the other hand, we've got this very unique local domestic uh, influence being, um, in many cases, some of the lowest livestock numbers we've had for, for a number of years in the, in the space of cattle. It's, it's over 20 years we've had livestock numbers. This, from a sheep point of view, it's, it's potentially about 100 years since we've had the sheep flock at this, um, such a small size. So, Reduced livestock numbers domestically, improved seasonal conditions has meant we've now got a very strong complex on the producer side of things here that is having a much bigger 
influence on our market, I feel, um, in terms of where we're sitting with livestock prices. Um, but for those of you in the, in the processing industry, obviously trying to balance that increased and heated demand by producing producers looking to restock and rebuild herds and flocks um, with those uncertainties and potentially softening demand in some of those consumer markets based on some of those other things. So we're in a very unique situation and it really is, uh, from my point, a bit of a battle of the bulls versus the bears, which way are the market's going to be driven. So getting to the point of the, the, the conversation, the presentation today, um, it's going to be around COVID-19. Um, feel free to ask questions as we go through. Um, as I said, I cover uh, beef, sheep, meat, pork, poultry and seafood markets. Um, happy to take any questions beyond what I'm talking about um, as we as we go through. Um, and if there's anything in particular that you'd like um, or you, you want to look at it a little bit further. The whole thing's probably going to be about 30 minutes uh, thereabouts and um, 30 to 45 minutes, but um, we'll probably then have some discussion and questions at the end. So COVID-19, um, this little critter here and we're all no doubt fully aware of the impact that it's had across the global market, uh, the, the world stage, you know, becoming a pandemic, affecting close to 8 million confirmed cases uh, as of yesterday. Um, what staggers me is you, you look at it um, in, in a numbers sense and around the world and the impact that it's having. And yesterday there were an additional uh, 118,502 cases confirmed in one day, 118,000 cases. So it's still having a massive impact across the world, affecting a, a large number of countries, some more so than others, some at different stages as well. Uh, obviously originating out of China and their initial lockdown measures, China's sort of one of the ones at the forefront of everything in terms of you know moving beyond some of their lockdown measures, starting to see a reopening in trade, whereas other countries such as the US and Brazil are really now still in the thick of it in terms of the, the impacts that it's having on their um, on their population, but also um, the, in turn what that means in terms of the consumption and economic activity in that space. Um, one of the unique things about it is, and one of the things we've always sort of feared and, and makes it very hard from a forecasting point of view is that being a virus and being um, in, in the population, um, we're moving through this uh, process whereby you're trying to control and contain it, but there is always the likelihood of getting second wave infections. And a lot of the commentary that's coming out at the moment well, through our economics team, et cetera, trying to provide forecasts on what growth might be in ourselves, having that same conversation. You obviously have to make assumptions at the moment, but one of the big risks is that there is still that sort of second wave. And whether that second wave is an even bigger impact or whether it's a lesser impact, whether the second wave occurs in the next couple of months or whether it's something that we see you know, stretched out over time and potentially come back around again when the Northern Hemisphere goes into winter towards the end of the year. Um, it's very much an uncertain, but uh, it's one to be mindful of. And we saw on the weekend uh, with Beijing having a new outbreak or a new number of new cases that um, discovered in, in Beijing out of a, uh, uh, they believe it originated out of a fish market. Um, and, and it's put a lot of, uh, seafood traders on, on notice in terms of some of the, the increased level of um, uh, inspection and controls that are being put in place. Uh, but it does highlight that there is that risk that we can see second waves of this and potentially lapses back into, or not so much lapses, but moves back into more controlled trading arrangements again. Um, we haven't seen in Beijing yet, and this was yesterday when I was checking, uh, any any sort of Wuhan style lockdowns as of yet, but they're definitely going into to, to managing some of their transport in and out, trying to contain things on a district level. Um, those sorts of things, you know, there is a very real potential that those sorts of things can continue to reoccur. And I think on one hand, it, it makes it very difficult for a trading point of view, but it's also going to impact that consumer and their trust and their willingness to go back out into the broader society as well. And that's going to mean, you know, that well, that's going to determine how long we're looking at in terms of any sort of recovery from this whole thing. So COVID-19 has had a very dramatic impact on the way we eat and what we buy. Um, so we've moved from being a very much a, um, uh, 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 an industry or a market that has been fairly evenly balanced in many markets between a food service side of things with restaurant trade and 
catering into um, into hospitality, etc., um, and retail sales. As you're all probably well aware, um, the restaurant trade effectively got shut down, and everything was pushed through the retail side of things. Consumers still had to eat, and they were no longer going out to to buy their food at a restaurant. Instead, to source it from a supermarket. Um, the picture on the right hand side there is my local supermarket, um, local Woolworths, that uh, I had to go up and see what everyone was talking about. I didn't join the bandwagon and line up for toilet paper. Um, I'm more interested in what's in the meat cabinet. Um, the picture on the right, the top right there is, um, is yeah, effectively the meat cabinet, not much left in it. Uh, a few hams, which understandably people don't see as something that they can just quickly cook that night. Um, but effectively bare of, of all product and no doubt those in the processing market that, that had contact with that would have seen and experienced in that, that week in March, that sudden increase in retail sales. I'm always interested as well as to what's going on in competing uh, product spaces. The, the little picture in the middle is effectively the alternatives protein cabinet. Um, in the uh, in, in the same area as as the the conventional meat. Um, and while I'd like to think that you know potentially there are a few more products left on the shelf there, it clearly shows that it was hit as well. And one of the things that I talk about further on in terms of the implications that might flow out of this and um, and how consumers are changing their perception of various things, you can see that it's not necessarily a case that people avoided it, um, if they might have been pushed into trying it, um, but it still also uh, saw an increase in, in demand at that period. So putting all that sort of stuff into numbers and what have we actually seen? Well, we've, we've seen um, retail sales jump dramatically uh, and food service sales drop. Uh, the, the graph on the left-hand side there, just showing uh, in, in the orange and dark blue, uh, the food service sales, year-on-year -year changes in sales for China and for the US. And you can see China, as I noted before, is a little bit ahead of the curve. So in January, the end of January, they were going down into their lockdown period and we saw you know, a 40% reduction in food service sales in January, uh, late January and into February for, for China. We've since started to see that recovery. As you see there in March, that orange line picks up. On the other hand, the retail sales have, have, have been have increased. Uh, as a result, you know, people cannot eat out, so they have to eat at home and, and they have to source their food from somewhere. And we can see the year on year change there for, for both the US and China in the retail sales picking up in the order of around 20% increase um, for, for retail sales. Um, it, it doesn't actually transpire across to a, a complete offset, i.e. The, the retail sales haven't necessarily offset the expenditure that people have made out of home. So uh, on one hand, you might actually say that that's potentially adding to the, the consumer's budget and, and they're able to save a little bit more because they're not spending as much. Maybe they're not eating as much as well. Um, whether or not that's able to offset any implications that that consumer might also be facing in the sense of potentially um, loss of work or, or reduced incomes as a result of some sort of um, uh, containment of salaries that a number of operators, a number of companies have put in place. On the, rest, on the right hand side there, we've got our open table data and you can see the restaurant trade effectively through that open table platform just dropped in March, uh, early March, um, and we don't have China data up there, so we don't see China sort of out ahead of it, but you can see the open table dinners for um, uh, Australia in, in the blue and the US in the orange. The light blue is actually the UK and the brown is Germany. So you can see various um, stages of recovery there too, that Australia or the US has been a re reasonably gradual recovery on the orange line on the uh, coming out the other side in May there. Um, Australia, you can you can clearly point that that jump in the dark blue line there to where we started to see our easing of restrictions um, early May, uh, sorry late May uh, and into early June and it's jumped up quite significantly. Um, so some of those bookings not quite back to where they were, but definitely early signs. Of, uh, of recovery and some of that re restaurant trade. And no doubt some of you are possibly noticing that in terms of the, the products that are being sold and, and who's, um, who's buying them. One thing I, I like to show, because unfortunately in Australia, we don't have the wholesale 
data to, to give the indication, but um, I'd be interested if there was anyone on the line um, in, in the discussion at the end as to whether or not this is the same sort of thing that you saw in the Australian market. Um, but we, we can get the data for um, wholesale prices in the US broken down into the different primals the cutout value and I think it's 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 quite an interesting um, process to put all these down in, in a historical or in a um, time series manner and see how the market reacted to the various points of this COVID-19 um, lockdown then uh, the implications it had beyond that. So what I've got here is the um, the the primal um, prices or the, the prices for, for chuck, round, rib and loin uh, and then the total overall um, cutout value for uh, for the US. So you can see there for the period for uh, most of 2019, uh, they're, they're all very, yeah, for, for, for through, through January and February, they're all very steady, sorry. If you go back to 2019, it's a very similar sort of pattern very consistent across the board. That's one of the advantages of the US system is the consistency and the volume that goes through the market. The reason why I've put the round and um, chuck and, and ribbon loin prices up there is just to show the differences and what the impact of that COVID-19 shutdown had on restaurant trade versus retail trade. Now it's not a perfect match, but effectively the chuck and round prices are more indicators of product that goes through the retail channel. The um, rib and loin prices are more indicators for prices that would go through that restaurant trade. So we get to the 13th of March there. Then we had the lockdown in the US and we can see all prices initially jumped uh, as a result of panic buying probably um, and, and people interested to try and secure as much product as possible. Then on in, in late March, um, we started to see those restaurant prices or the, the restaurant destined uh, loin and rib cuts start to come back down again, whereas the, the chuck and the round prices stayed uh, a lot well, more elevated uh, than what they were before. You can see the cutout value come back down as a result of those um, rib and loin prices coming back down, but the reduction in rib and loin price was offset by the increase in chuck and round. So the overall value of the carcass, not too much different, but a very big shift into where that product was going and who was demanding it. Now, I think we we probably experienced something similar in Australia. Uh, I'd be keen if anyone was willing to have a conversation at the end, uh, if, if that was the case, um, because I think it's a fairly unique situation. And one of the key messages out of this, I think for everyone in the industry, is that the shocks and the disruptions that we've seen as a result of COVID-19 uh, has really highlighted the need to be flexible in your system to be able to pivot. And speaking to a number of operators in this space, you know, those that have had either connections into different sorts of um, supply channels with, uh, that would allow them to, to pivot from you know, a, a restaurant focused trade into a retail focused trade, um, have access to packaging, have access to supply chains that allow that to, to happen, have been the ones that have actually been able to manage it a lot better. Now this is where I think the US and, and Australia differs. Um, in the US they obviously had large impacts with a number of their uh, meat plant operators, number of meat plant uh, workforce being affected by COVID-19 and also the concern no doubt amongst the workforce and, and their willingness to turn up and work in some of those meat plants. I've just got the JBS Greeley plant there. Uh, it was one of the first ones to go down. And, and experience a complete shutdown. Obviously, a number of them uh, experienced a, a quite a significant slowdown as a, re a result of the reduced workforce that they had available. We got to, um, and, and you can see as a result of that, basically they put a pinch point in the system. We saw cattle prices start to drop because those cattle were on feed and be ready to be slaughtered were, were being backed up against the door. They couldn't get them off uh, fast enough. So they were filling up their feed yards in a hurry. On the other hand, the food, the beef going out the other end was in such short supply. We started to see, as we've got here on the graph, the prices start to really escalate as a result of that shortage. So in late April, they reached a point where they were slaughtering almost half as many cattle as they were last year. Uh, since that late April, the recovery has slowly progressed and we're now, I think, at about about a 95% uh, percent of last year's slaughter numbers. Last year's slaughter numbers were slightly higher than um, the year before. So 
I don't know if you could call it normal yet, but um, they're, they're getting back to a, a level that is more um, commensurate with what their normal operations are. As a result, we've obviously seen those prices start to come back down as that beef has started to, to flow back through the system again. And you can see those retail destined cuts effectively have seen quite a significant drop from where they were uh, back down to almost levels uh, for what they were in February. Now, if, if you're a processor that's sending beef to the US, um, this is an indication I believe as to, to why we saw a pickup in the US import price for Australian uh, 90 CL product. Um, back through May there, we saw some strong prices go to the US as all prices in the US were pushed up because of that shortage in supply. Subsequently, we've seen that US import price start to come back down again, reflecting the same position of the US prices over there. And that market's returned to, to somewhat of, of more, no, more normality uh, or more normal levels. But there's the physical disruption to, uh, that's been caused by COVID-19. Uh, the other thing that is probably going to see a little bit more of a legacy or a longer term impact is what's going to happen from an economic point of view. And this is probably the one that is, is going to have the longer lasting impact. It's, it's the question mark we've got at the moment because we've seen quite a severe disruption in the physical trade, i.e. moving from restaurant and food service to retail trade and the, the social lockdowns, et cetera, et cetera. This economic impact is going to have a much longer uh, legacy. We're going to see those people that are displaced from work and the whole economy start to, to shrink a bit. That's going to affect that consumer's willingness to pay. Um, red meat as a premium protein is generally one of those products that does wear it a bit more, um, although noting that within the carcass itself there will be those cuts, um, you know, pro probably those that are destined for a QSR style restaurant, um, cheaper, more commodity traded products are probably going to not see as much of an impact, whereas those at the very high end are possibly going to see a little bit more of an impact as a result of uh, reduced consumer spending. I've got up here on the graph at the moment the world GDP growth rates um, and I've got it for the, the global growth in, in the bars, the blue bars and the China and US growth rates. You can see the dip there in 2009, that was the global financial crisis. Quite a small dip in contrast to the relatively positive growth we've seen throughout the last 20 years effectively. Um, when you put it in, you can then put it in context and, and this is where initially everyone was comparing everything to the global financial crisis and can we get some sort of indication of the global financial crisis and what the flow on effects of that were. Now we're starting to look at what the actual economic impacts are for the COVID-19 impact and you can see we're expecting a much more severe drop in economic growth than what we actually experienced in the global financial crisis. Not only that, the GFC tended to be isolated or not so much isolated, it tend to affect some markets more than others and some regions more than others, whereas this is gonna have a much wider impact. It's, it's affecting you know, the, whole, the whole globe around the world. We've got Europe and China and Southeast Asia and North America and South America all feeling this at the same time. So you can see there that um, these are the Rabo forecasts for economic growth for 2020. And we're going to drop from what was a, a positive, probably about a two and a half percent for global growth, we're going to drop to negative 4.1 in 2020. China's going to see its lowest growth that it's seen. Um, I'm just trying to remember when the, the, the earliest number I've seen on a Chinese GDP growth graph has been, but definitely for the last 20 or 30 years, we haven't seen this. Um, and therefore some real questions around how that Chinese consumer is going to manage uh, uh, an economy that's operating at that speed. Uh, the US growth dropping to minus 6.3%, uh, which as you can see is much lower than what they experienced in that GFC there. So um, not to sound like the bearer of bad news, but this is expected to be quite a severe haircut in terms of economic growth and there will be parts of the economy that feel it in quite a big way. Most of the other, most of the forecasts though do actually show that 2021 will be a return to recovery and positive growth again. So even the US, um, we're expecting to see positive growth in 2020. 
2021. There's a whole lot of uh, commentary and the economists get quite excited when they start talking about V curves or U curves or what that actual recovery looks like. At the moment, it's coming down and going back up, but more realistically, we're probably gonna see a much more gradual recovery. This is on an annual basis, and it might be the fact that the next six months are relatively slow, but seeing some improvement, and then sort of beyond 2021 into halfway through 2021, we start to really sort of escalate a little bit more. But at the moment, um, most of the forecasters are suggesting that we're going to get back into some sort of positive growth again next year, but that it will probably be a delayed impact. And as I said at the beginning, we're still very cautious around the possibilities of subsequent or second round um, impacts of COVID-19 and, and second waves of the virus spreading. If you add those two numbers together, though it's important to look at it in the sense well what's the actual net position at the end of 2021 and realistically there are not a lot of countries that are kind of come out of the current declining growth and then the subsequent increase next year in any net positive position all those on the graph up there are showing that over the next two years if you add up those two growth rates the red ones are going to experience a contraction in their economy the green ones and encouragingly for us it includes china uh, Korea and India hopefully is a developing opportunity. Um, other than all the other ones out there that are red are going to experience over the next two years a net reduction in economic activity. So um, just expecting it to be a little bit slower. So as I said before, you know, trying to put things into context and what they actually mean, um, we did a bit of work early on looking at um, the global financial crisis and what happened in the global financial crisis and food service sales. You can see on this graph here, we've mapped the the month to month change in food service sales as a as a three month moving average. So on the left, and I don't know if my mouse actually comes up here, but we've got most of the time positive growth through 2006, 2007. Um, even into 2008, um, when we um, when we start to see um, so still see some positive positive month on month growth in food service, and you can see the U.S. unemployment rate there is the orange line, um, generally ticking along at about five percent up until 2008. Then we had the um, in September 2008, uh, we had the the Lehman Brothers collapse and a number of other financial institutions collapse, effectively starting the the GFC. So it was late 2008 that actually saw the biggest contraction, and it, that's where most of the commodity markets moved. But if you put it in an annualised sense, the economic um, growth rate 2009 is the one that actually shows up as being the negative growth. Um, but most of the activity happened in 2008 around those financial institutions um, going into receivership. Basically that then triggered, you can see the unemployment rate in the US jumped from 5% up towards 10%. And we saw negative uh, month on month growth in food service. So food service sales declined from the end of 2008. Uh, and it was a month on month decline all the way through to about the same period in 2009. So it was about months worth of negative growth for those food service outlets. Um, that's what happened in the GFC. What does that mean for uh, our situation at the moment? And again, no point that really making these comparisons um, is now becoming a little bit futile because as you can see along there, I've got exactly the same information, but over the longer time period. So starting in 2006, again, um, we've got the month on month uh, change in food service and the blue bars along the top and the US unemployment rate in the orange along the bottom. If you bring us all the way up to 2020 and what's happened there, you can see our unemployment rate in the US has gone from just under 4% to about 15%, so a lot higher than what we saw in the GFC. We've also seen a contraction in our food service sales um, drop far more dramatically, dropping 30, 35% um, month on month uh, compared to the very small decline that was not even a 1% drop back in the GFC. So we, we're looking at a much more severe contraction uh, in economic terms, we're looking at a much more severe contraction in terms of the food service uh, operations um, in the US as a result of this COVID-19. So it's a little bit hard to make um, heads or tails as to whether or not this is going to be 
the same or we're going to multiply the GFC impacts by a factor of uh, 10 um, because there are so many different things at play here and remembering back in 2008, 2009, uh, from an Australian point of view anyway, China was only a very small player as, as an export market for, for many of our things and didn't really come onto the, onto the scene until about 2013. So there are a whole lot of other factors here that are potentially going to impact um, or, or influence how Australia comes out of that, how Australia comes out of this whole situation. Uh, so it's a little bit hard to draw conclusions, but really the message of this is that we are looking at a very severe contraction and a very severe change in, in what's happened as a result of COVID-19. So some of the structural things that we've seen come out of COVID-19 and um, uh, clearly from the, the graphs that I showed at the beginning, but there's been a very heavy shift from restaurant and food service to retail and excuse me, uh, eat, at, eat in dining or eat at home dining as opposed to, to, uh, to restaurant dining. Um, and what that actually might mean in terms of where we see the, the, um, the, the supply chain or the, the food consumption um, of the future, I think there are a few things to take out of it in terms of some of the messages um, that, that we're seeing or some of the experiences that we're having at the moment and what that might mean for future consumer trends. So um, we've seen a very big shift um, from the current restaurant models that they've got into delivery and drive-through and ultimately those restaurants that have actually performed better um, through the COVID-19 have generally been those that have actually been able to adapt to um, the, the food service style delivery and, and have been able to push more of their food service, more of their sales into that delivery and drive-through and takeaway side of things. Um, some of the uh, some of the numbers that we've seen out of the out of the US are showing that that we've seen restaurants over there that have actually switched into the delivery and drive-through have have moved about uh, or are now earning about 90% of their sales uh, through those deliveries rather than the actual dine-in delivery, uh, sorry, dine-in service that they'd actually provided before. Um, and the limited service or quick service operators um, such as pizza chains, um, burger joints, et cetera, are showing much stronger, much faster um, recovery rates uh, following the, the release or removal of some of these lockdown things. Um, funny little picture in the top left there, uh, it's a picture of a queue for the McDonald's in uh, New Zealand when New Zealand eased their lockdowns in on the 28th of April. Uh, it's always interesting to see how consumers respond to things and, and we can't necessarily say that the population in Christchurch, New Zealand is a, um, is a good indicator for how the rest of the population um, reacts, but I think it gives you some sort of idea as to how a consumer might have responded to the fact that they can now go out and they can access a, uh, a, a food service operator. Um, obviously, they couldn't go and sit down and have a restaurant meal, but they were more than keen to sit in their car and line up and get, get some drive through Maccas. Um, some of the other things that we've seen through the process, there's been heavily, heavy use of promotions and discounting, and, and I'm sure some of you in the supply chain would, would be aware of that. Obviously, those premium or higher value products that were destined for the restaurant trade, they're still there, they still need to be sold, but to be able to move that volume through the supply chain, obviously there has to be a discount in the price to keep that product going through. Uh, it's interesting from an analyst point of view, um, we've got to look at things both from a value and a volume point of view. Um, and it's the point being that generally, um, regardless of what's going on in the world, if you're producing beef or if you're producing sheep meat, that's based on what's available on the ground at the time. It's then a uh, 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 it's then a process of of what price you put on that to be able to move that through the supply chain. So still producing similar volumes, but you just have to take a haircut on the price to be able to keep the volume going through um, to to affect to to effectively make sure you manage that demand. Um, so we've seen a lot of um, promotion and discounting. Um, we've seen a lot more um, in the casual dining um, uh, chains. Um, sorry. Haven't seen as much haven't seen as much recovery in the in the casual dining chains, but they're those restaurants that can and are able to embrace the delivery experience. I've got an Uber Eats picture up there. That's an interesting factor, and in that a number of those platforms across the world, you would have thought early on in the piece this would have been a prime opportunity 
opportunity for, say, those those delivery platforms, Uber Eats, et cetera, to really take advantage of this. If people cannot go out and dine in restaurants to bring the restaurant to the home, but a lot of them have seen a sort of mixed bag. Some are reporting increasing customer registrations, but not necessarily uh, increasing sales or large increases in sales that we might have expected. And partly that might be due to the fact that some of those restaurants have, have shut, uh, but there are also a whole lot of other things in the process in, in terms of the cost, but also from a consumer point of view, if you're pushed into, um, eating at home and you've got more time on your hands, then the ability to go and bake a bit of sourdough uh, suddenly becomes a, a new whole new prospect for you rather than actually buying it and, and having it home delivered. So it's an interesting one. Probably hasn't seen the, the level of growth that we thought. And as a result, may not necessarily mean a huge structural increase, a structural change towards that style of operation. But still, they have managed to, to get through this and have taken some advantage of it, albeit not as much as what we would have thought. Um, we think in terms of the recovery process, our US colleagues have just released a report recently looking at the US food service industry. And their, they, their, their belief is that the limited service and quick service restaurants are gonna be able to return to previous strong growth levels fairly quickly. On the other hand, the full service restaurants are gonna see negative growth and we're gonna see the ongoing restriction around um, COVID-19, the limitations that people have in terms of attending restaurants, uh, plus also the concern of the consumer about attending sort of public public gatherings are gonna add to that further um, uh, slow return in terms of the, the restaurant trail sales. But if, if we're selling beef to the US in the form of lean trimmings, um, it's good news for us in the sense that that QSR restaurant, uh, we believe is gonna have some fairly strong um, growth levels and return to what they were before. Um, and the other long lasting thing is indicating, I suppose, that people are gonna be eating possibly eating more from home. Um, there was a Nielsen survey that showed that about 80%, 86% of Chinese consumers said that they would eat more at home um, and eat more at home more often as a result of the, the COVID-19 and compared to what they had done previously. So more eating at home, but also um, some strong return to growth for those QSR um, and limited service restaurants. In addition to sort of the physical and structural change that we're seeing in the market, we also think there's going to be a number of behavioural changes. Um, now, it's very difficult to quantify this, uh, but there was a survey that I, I found um, stating that 25% of young British millennials um, say that COVID-19 pandemic has made a vegan diet more appealing. I think there's definitely going to be a lot more noise in the space. There's a lot more conversation around, well, has our conventional food supply chain um, failed us in the sense that we had those shortages on the retail shelves when suddenly we had that massive um, panic buying. Um, but also there's going to be some concerns around, you know, um, the environmental, um, the health, the sustainability impacts, all those that were sort of pottering along before. I think we'll potentially get a little bit of a kick as a result of this COVID-19, but I don't feel that it's necessarily gonna change change the world. Uh, as you saw in the, the photo um, that I had earlier on in the in the local Woolworths there, you know, they did see an increase in demand and a lot of them are, ex, uh, are talking about the increased sales that they've seen, but I would say, dare say that that's probably in line uh, with the general increase in retail sales anyway. Um, it's provided a good platform for them to scale up. The question is, you know, once we return to some degree of normality, how many of those consumers are going to be permanently moved across uh, to try alternatives, or how many of them will just take it up as part of a flexitarian, more balanced diet? Um, I, I, I don't necessarily feel at this stage that it's necessarily going to be the kicker like we saw for margarine back in the Second World War when you had such severe butter shortages that it forced everyone to try margarine and it effectively margarine sales up and people became accustomed to eating it. And as a result, we saw margarine start to become a, um, uh, quite a substantial part of the dairy diet. I think the shortage in, in conventional proteins on the shelf um, uh, the, 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 and the time frame that we're talking of only about a week or so meant that people might have been pushed or forced to try an alternative for a very short period, but have had the ability to go back to what they want. And as a result, I don't see it's 
it's necessary to give the alternative proteins a huge leg up in this process. It'll help them a little bit, but I, I don't see it as being a huge one. Um, the other thing also is that um, we, we might find that um, there are increased um, um, preparor prepar preparations, I suppose, in terms of from a consumer's point of view. Um, again, that same survey was suggesting that 37% of consumers believe that the future of people will in the future, people will buy long, long food and drink more often. Uh, I've got the, uh, the the tin of salmon there. I don't know if anyone's seen the Michael McIntyre comedy skit of uh, of the spice shelf um, and how the poor old tin of tuna that was sitting in the back of the cupboard uh, never saw the day of, never saw a ray of sunlight. But um, definitely through COVID-19, uh, tin tuna sales we know have have jumped enormously. Um, it's been the 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 time to shine for, for tin tuna. Um, potentially that might encourage consumers to just have a few stocks in the cupboard of some of those non-perishable items as well. Um, the other one is, is online sales and, and we're starting to see uh, a bit more of that uh, occur. I mean, obviously the, the growth in online sales has, has been occurring over a period of time, um, but we have seen in, in a number of economies that some of those uh, online sales have really got a shot in the arm as a result of COVID-19. Uh, we saw in Korea, for example, online food sales rose 92% in February when they were in the middle of their COVID-19 infections. Uh, we saw in China for Q1 2020, um, the food retail sales grew by about 12.5%. Meanwhile, online sales of food items increased by 32%. So. Um, just over double um, the, the retail food sales growth. So online food sales platforms probably got a bit of a shot in, in the arm um, as a result of uh, COVID-19. I know definitely from a personal point of view, we had uh, done online food shopping in an on and off sort of ad hoc manner for a while. Um, but since COVID-19, um, it's really pushed us into doing uh, doing that a lot more regularly now. And I think it'll become a lot more of a custom for, or people become a lot more accustomed to doing it. As, as a result, we'll probably see that as well. So managing managing the supply chain to be able to, to meet some of those new needs. There's also over the top of this, and I haven't got a picture for it, but obviously with COVID-19, some of those concerns around health and nutrition, um, obviously being a virus, people are a lot more acutely aware of what their, their state of health is. Uh, we might see a level of interest increase in um, uh, nutritionally uh, enhanced or in nutritionally uh, benefited um, products that, that will cater to some of those new needs of that consumer um, as they seek out things and are a lot more conscious about what they're actually purchasing. That's sort of the COVID-19 and really the main focus of the conversation. But as I said before, we've all got to put this into the context of what's actually happening in Australia because all those things are coming at us from an external point of view. Internally here in Australia, we are facing a situation where we've got some of the lowest flock, or we've, we've got the lowest sheep flock in, in close to 100 years. We've got the lowest cattle herd in over 20 years. Our slaughter rates are going to be down dramatically this year as a result of improved seasons. Uh, not only because we've got limited livestock numbers, but the improved seasons mean that uh, we're going to see a much stronger demand from those producers looking to either hold on to stock or purchase stock in that same market that, um, that, that the processes and feedlotters, et cetera, are active in. So a lot more competition for a much smaller pool of animals. Sheep slaughter is expected to be down about 30% this year. Lamb slaughter down five. Cattle slaughter we expect to be down 14% this year, which, you know, in the context of things, we're looking at sort of decade low slaughter numbers. So that's going to mean that on a supply side, it's very hard to get the product. Um, there'll be high prices for those livestock to be able to, to, to secure them. And at the same time, some uncertainties in terms of the markets that are being sold into. Um, over the top of that as well, you've got to remember and you can't forget because it's probably even more important than a COVID-19 is the African swine for impacts in China. We're still estimating that this year, the Chinese pork production is going to be down another 15 to 20% on what it was last year. We saw what happened to Australian exports to, to China last year. Can't remember the sheep ones off the top of my head, but I know from a beef point of view, it was up around 75, 80% increase on the year before. That is still there. 
yes, granted that the Chinese consumer can't go out to the restaurant and yes, granted the Chinese economy is going to be softer, but at the same time, they have taken a massive whack in terms of their domestically produced protein volumes and they will still need increased imports to be able to meet some of that gap. So that sits there in the background as well. I think from an Australian point of view, there's there's obviously a, a fairly positive outlook for a producer uh, in the sense that the livestock prices are high. There's probably some challenging times from a processor point of view in terms of some of that uncertainty in markets that you're selling into. Granted that there will be opportunities such as that quick service restaurant, et cetera, into the US, some of those more um, lower value cuts uh, that might see some strong demand. Um, and given our limited supplies in Australia, um, you might be able to keep the volumes going through. But again, also managing some of the capital in the in the industry as well, given the low volumes that we've got. But overall, I think it's still positive. Hopefully, um, we will see no second waves of the COVID-19 and the economies around the world start to recover. And as they do, um, hopefully we'll be able to build the, the volume of product going into those markets from a domestic point of view as well. That's, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Um, managed to do the 45 minutes pretty well. Um, happy to take any questions, Amanda, or um, any, any discussion if people have got any questions about the presentation or anything else that might be on their mind. Fantastic, Angus, and thank you very much for giving your insights into what the crystal ball is going to look like as we move forward. And um, definitely uncertain times, and let's hope that the second wave um, does not have a huge impact. There has been a couple of questions um, in terms of, or and, and in particular a comment, just in terms of um, the vegan meat alternative debate. And it was good to see that there was a number of those vegan type meats left on the shelves when all the red meat was actually being mm -hmm. taken as well. There's also um, a question sent through by Patrick um, in terms of consumption. We've seen that in Australia, there's been an increase in consumption on red meat due to our reliability of our supply. Do you feel that um, we can be marketing our reliability of our supply chain into markets into the future on top of our quality and safety? And do you think that will give Australia an advantage? Uh, sorry, I was trying to do two things at once there, read his question and listen to you repeat it at the same time. Uh, okay. We've seen an increase in, uh, in Australia, increased consumption of red meat due to our reliability of supply chain rather than people uh, provide commentary as this has been occurring on people losing faith in the red meat. Change diets, plant based. I, I, I think definitely, and I and this is one of the things I I strongly believe in terms of you know conversations we were having a couple of years ago when our um our brazilian counterpart came out um and there are a lot of questions all the time about oh you know with brazil getting access to china is it going to steal our market share um i think we need to, to really highlight some of the things that we've got um and the credentials that we've got and and you know having the um the the rigor in the system that we've got um some of the um the check balances through there um, but also the, um, the 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 operators in the system as well with the credibility that it provides I think that really does set us apart um, and I think with the increasing awareness by the consumer around everything these days you know potentially we've, we've got consumers that are spending a lot more time at home and, and might be looking into things a lot more um, we've, you've really got to emphasize or sell that that attribute I think um, to to those uh, in in that in those consumer markets as as providing as as said um, you know a, a very reliable um, but also a um, uh, a very safe um, and and a, a supply chain that that's um, that's that that backs that all the way through um, I think we we will always challenge we will always be challenged a little bit in terms of our reliability because we're very heavily still a grass-based system and therefore season does influence it. Um, but at the same time, that works to um, potentially highlight another attribute of the industry that might work in terms of marketing that product as well as being a, you know, whether it be a grass-fed or a naturally occurring, et cetera. Um, so I think 
what we what the whole industry really needs to work towards is making sure that that we are providing a clear understanding of some of the values and the attributes that are added to that. It doesn't mean that you'll be able to sell that product to every person in the world. Um, there, are, there are consumers out there and customers out there that are looking for, it might be, a very cheap source of protein, um, in which case we may not fit the specs that they need, they're looking for. But at the same time, there will be a buyer out there for the product that we're looking to sell. And I think it's about making sure we, we identify those key people that are on the same level, so to speak, as us. Um, and make sure we can really demonstrate the attributes that we've got. Fantastic, thank you, Angus. And I don't know if that necessarily if answered it. It was a, a long point, but I'll. No worries. Um, if anyone's got any last minute questions, please feel free to send them through um, and we'll just wait for a second in case there's any questions. Just thank you once again for all participating and would really like to thank Angus for his time and imparting his knowledge in what the future looks like. And hopefully we'll see 2021 return to some sort of re recovery phase and a bit more normality as well. So um, thank you. And we haven't had any other questions come in. So thank you very much. As we conclude, you will be sent a survey. If you could please fill that survey out, that will really help AMPC um, continue to make sure that we're delivering to the membership and our um, wider audience what you would like to see and how we can continue to improve these webinars. So thank you very much. Thanks, Angus. No problem. Thank you.